Thanks for the Bible reading, Rob. It is such a great chapter, Acts chapter 1. But what I want to focus on is just the first verse in Acts chapter 1, which reads, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Now with Jesus, what was so great about Jesus? So he would do things and then he would teach those things that he did. Like Unlike the Pharisees who would like say things but then they, they wouldn't do things. But with Jesus, like he would do things and then teach others how to do the same things. So what I want to do this morning is just preach a sermon about examples from Jesus' life, the things that he did which we can look at and learn from. So the title of my sermon is The Goodly Example of Jesus. The Goodly Example of Jesus. And goodly means attractive, excellent or admirable. And those are words which can definitely describe the life of Jesus. He lived an excellent life, an admirable life, and his life is also a life which should be Uh, we should be attracted to, which we should want to be like him as far as the way he lived. And he's given us a goodly example to follow. And there's there's many aspects of Jesus' life that we could could look at as examples. You could preach for the the rest of your life just about the examples that you could get from Jesus' life. But I've got seven this morning, which I've just found in my own Bible reading, which sort of jumped out at me, so I chose just to run with these seven. And the first one I want to look at, let's get straight into it, is that Jesus, as a child, you should start seeking after God. This is something we can learn from the life of Jesus. So as a young child, Jesus was already developing in his spiritual life, starting to, to know God in a, in a powerful way. And it's something that we can learn that as children, I guess the first point is going to be towards the young people, the children, that we can start, even as children, young children start to know God and we should make the most of that time as being a young child to start to know God. And if you can turn to Luke chapter 2, and while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Hebrews 2, 17 says, Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself have suffered being tempted... He's able to succor or to help them that are tempted. So verse 17 says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. So in all things Jesus became a man. So that means he became a baby. It means he became a a child. So he was a child. So he became a child. So therefore, as a child, you can relate to Jesus because he was a child. So he understands what it's like to be a toddler, to be like a 12-year-old, a 13-year-old, a teenager. He understands and you can relate to him. And it says here that he himself has suffered being tempted. So he's suffered in every way that you could suffer. He understands that he can aid those who are suffering. So as children, young people, you can go to Jesus and he can aid you. He knows what it was like to be 12, to have lots of brothers and sisters and to get picked on and to get blamed for things he didn't do. He knows all those struggles that young people go through. So you can turn to Jesus now and start to know God and Jesus can help you do that. So have a look in Luke chapter 2 verse 41. Let's start looking at the famous story when Jesus was left in the temple. Love this story. Luke chapter 2 verse 41 says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. Look, I would imagine most 12-year-olds would be scared to be left behind in Jerusalem. A strange city while their parents leave. Like I remember when I was 13 I started to catch the bus by myself from say Wagga Wagga or Tamora in New South Wales up to Queensland and my biggest fear was that I might get left behind at a bus stop. Like I might, can you know how they stop at all crazy times when you go for those long bus trips? They'll stop at one o'clock in the morning and my fear was that I would get off the bus and then for some reason I'd get stuck on the toilet or something like that and I would miss getting back on the bus was my greatest fear. But not Jesus. Like He didn't have this fear. Because as an early age, he's starting to, to trust in the Lord already. And let me read to you um, Proverbs 14, verse 26 says, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and his children shall have a place of refuge. So Jesus knew he had a, he had a place of refuge because he trusted in the Father. So when he's left behind in Jerusalem so he can go to the temple 
and speak to the, um, the, the believers there in the temple. Like He had a refuge from God. He knew the Father would look after him because he is going about the Father's business. And even young people, you know, if, you, if you're doing God's work, if you're seeking to know God and you do find yourself in a scary situation, look, you have a refuge from God. So seek to know God early and you can have that refuge, that confidence like Jesus had that God's always going to be with you and look after you. And like, who knows what could have happened? You know, you've been left behind in Jerusalem for three days or four days. Um, but, you know, Jesus looked after by, by the fire because he trusted in God. Let's get reading in verse... 44, Luke chapter 2 verse 44 says, But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him, and it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Look, you see Jesus is seeking after the things of God. Like it's in his heart as a 12-year-old to seek after the things of God. And children, like you should be seeking after the things of God. That's an example we can learn from Jesus. And Jesus is going to where the spiritual people are. He's going to God's house. He's going to the temple. And he's seeking after these so-called, hopefully, you know, spiritual people. And they're listening to Jesus and they're blown away by his answers. And children, you know, you should not be intimidated by adults. Like Jesus wasn't intimidated as a 12-year-old boy speaking to these, these religious men in the temple. And children, like you should seek out, first of all, your parents. Like don't be afraid to go to your parents and say, look, I've been reading this in my Bible. You know, this is what I believe it says. Well, what do you think, Dad or Mum? And then hopefully your mum will be, or your dad will be like amazed by your understanding. And you can ask them questions and, and seek, seek to understand spiritual things. And I'm sure Pastor Kevin is not going to mind if your parents are happy you know, to go to him and ask him questions. Look, I was reading this in the Bible. You know, what do you think, Pastor Kevin? He, he might say, what do you think? <laughs> and then you can just expand what you understand. You know, we shouldn't, as children, like, don't be afraid to go to adults, speak to adults, and, and um, just ask them questions. Because if you're hungry for God, look, that's what you're going to do. You're going to go to your parents, you're going to go to the pastor, and you can go, if your parents are happy for you to, you know, go speak to other adults in the church and ask them questions. But I think it's interesting there, too, that it says that they looked for him for three days. And Jesus, like, that's probably up to the four, four days that he was away from his parents. And I, I, I just was thinking, well, what, what, what did he do? You know, what did, where did he sleep and what did he eat? And maybe, look, maybe some lady in the temple saw him there and sort of took him in and said, well, what are you doing here? You've been here for a couple of days now and where are your parents? And imagine Jesus said, look, my, my parents are going, to kind of, are going to come and get me in about two days' time and they'll be here looking for me and it's all good. And it's like, okay, well, you come with us and we'll feed you and... And then Jesus goes back to the temple and he's just seeking after the things of God. So look, Jesus would have had this confidence, like, God's going to look after me. It's, it's okay, don't worry about me being here by myself. I'm going about my father's business. And children, you can have that confidence in God. Like, as children, like, you face a lot of challenges. Like, you face, you know, school, homeschool, and trying to, uh, you know, navigate friendships and peers and all that sort of stuff. But if you have that confidence in God as your refuge, it's going to make life a lot easier. So seek to know God as a young person. And in this church, like this is such a, a great church as a young person to seek to know God. Like this is like the rarity. Like you might not realise that young people, but this is the exception to the rule in Australia. This is a rarity. Like it took me 20 years to find this church. So if you're a young person in this church, don't just take it for granted. Like, seek to hear the preaching, get around godly people, go soul winning, learn all these things, and you can excel. Like, you can even amaze adults like out there in the world. Like, a child in this church could be more advanced than like 90% of so-called uh, safe people like in the world. Okay, because what you, the preaching that you hear and, and the work that you do. And, and just the service that you can you can offer God in this house. So this is such a, a privilege to be in this place. And and like children can go soul winning and give the gospel, you know, in this church. Whereas most Christians wouldn't wouldn't know what to do out there in the world. But you can be like a twelve year old, thirteen year old, fifteen year old, sixteen year old, and you can be more advanced in the kingdom of God than most adults that you meet out there who are saved, you know, because we're in this such a great environment. Okay, and this is what Jesus was seeking out. He's seeking out the best place he can go. To, to hear the word of God, ask questions. And it's, we, we, we come here every Sunday and Wednesday, so don't miss this opportunity. 
And verse 48, And when they saw him, they were amazed, and his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou last dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is that ye sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And Jesus is he's showing like his zeal for God at an early age, his, his zeal for his heavenly father to know him and and like his parents couldn't understand the things he said. Like he was coming out with these things and, he, and mum and dad were like, well, we don't understand. <laughs> we don't know what he's talking about because he's so spiritual, like he's, he's advanced so much in his Christian walk. And Proverbs 20, verse 11, I'll read it to you. Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. And this is certainly true of Jesus. Like he was known by his doings. He was a pure child and he was, he was right. He was right. And look, children in this church, you are going to be known by your doings. And let those, those doings just be righteous like Jesus was. Let, let, us be, let you be known as like a child of God, a seeking after God, a soul winner, and you'll be known by those doings. By all means, have fun as a child. Make mistakes, mess up, go on adventures, but at the same time, just set your heart to know after God at, at an early age. Don't waste your, your young years. And verse 51, Luke 2, 51 says, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these things in her heart. Thank God for good mums. You know, I'm saved today because of a good mum. Because you know, my mum prayed for me, shared the gospel with me, and eventually at 19 I got saved. Like wasted a lot of years, but got saved at 19. Like thank God for good mothers. And, and Jesus had a good mother, and she heard all these things that Jesus said that she didn't understand, but she kept them in her heart. So thank God for good mothers. And... And Jesus, he was subject unto his mum and his stepdad. Like, just imagine that. Like, Jesus knew all things. He, he's God, but he chose to be subject to his mum and his stepdad, Joseph. And I imagine, like, he would have got in trouble for things he didn't do, but he just took the punishment. His brothers and sisters probably tried to throw him under the bus for things, but, you know, he just didn't, you know, re react in the flesh. He just... You know, it was, a, a, was just a perfect child in all ways. So he's a great example for you to follow. And let me read to you from Proverbs 23, verse 24. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. So be a child that's going to make your mum and dad happy. Like if you want to make mum and dad happy, Serve God. And as, as parents, what we need to do with our children is help them to develop their own walk with God. We don't want them just to ride on the coattails of mum and dad. We want them to have their own individual walk with God. And that should be our greatest joy as parents, to see our children not just sort of going with the flow of mum and dad and church, but to see them forge their own path with God, their own walk with God, their own relationship with God. And one of my favourite verses in the Bible, I'll just read it to you, it's 3 John 1 verse 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Look, that should be your, your testimony as a parent. Like you should have no greater joy to see that your children are walking with God, walking their own walk with God. And that's definitely my, this is what I believe as well. It's just true for me. Like I don't get any greater joy than to see my children having their own walk with God, like doing their own things, having their own prayer life, going soul winning, giving the gospel. And I'll give you an example of Georgia. Like on Friday, she was giving the gospel to her cousin. And on the way home in the car, she was saying, look, I was, I was talking to my cousin and, and I asked him, you know, do you know for sure you're going to go to heaven? Or what do you have to do to go to heaven? And he gave a bit of a goofed up answer. So Georgia was saying, well, actually, this is what the Bible says. Look, it doesn't give me any greater joy in life than to hear my children uh, walking in truth. Like, you know, if I could, like, well, nothing would make me happier in life. Like, give me all the riches and all that sort of stuff in the world, and that wouldn't make me as happy as what it made me just to hear that George has given the gospel on, on her own initiative, having their own walk with God, thinking about spiritual things, asking mum and dad questions. Look, nothing makes me happier than that. As parents, that should be our number one goal as far as parenting, is that our children have their own walk with God. It's so easy to allow them to slip under the radar and you can neglect that. But as, as parents, let's make sure that we put the effort in and the time in to our children, that they know God themselves, but they understand spiritual things. They understand salvation by grace. It's not of works. You can't lose it. 
but they need to understand that for themselves. They need to understand for themselves why we're King James only. With all these important fundamental things about repentance, what you have to do to be saved, they need to understand for themselves, not just because Dad said, therefore, this is what you have to believe, but they need to understand it for themselves. And that way it's going to be their own walk with God. It's going to be their own convictions about spiritual things. And Luke 2, verse 52 says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. So Jesus, he was a likeable child. He was a favourable child by God and man. So man like Jesus. And if you're walking with God as a child, you're going to have favour with people. People are going to like you. People are going to bless you and look out for you and, and give you blessings. And that was the case for Jesus. People knew who Jesus was. And he was a, a likeable child in Galilee, in, in Nazareth, like people knew of him. So if you can turn to Mark chapter 6, verse 1, and we're going to work on, move towards now our second point in the sermon. The second goodly example of Jesus was that he was known as being a hard worker. He was known as being a hard worker. So Mark chapter 6 verse 1, it says, And he went out from hence and came into his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which he has given unto him? that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. And this, listen to this, verse 3. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. So Jesus returns from being baptised by, by John and being in the wilderness for 40 days, and he returns to his, own, his hometown. He's going to start his ministry in his home church in Nazareth, and he gets up and he's preaching, and they're like, well, where did he get all this? This is Jesus the carpenter. So they knew him as being the carpenter. They knew him as being a hard worker. They knew him as having a job, doing stuff, and working hard with his hands. See, it wasn't, this is Jesus the, the unemployed guy. This is Jesus the surfy. He's always down the beach surfing. Now, this is Jesus the carpenter. And as men and women, we should be known as people that, that work. Look, I understand when you're like you're young, you're, you're, you're a teenager, you're still trying to navigate the workforce and find out where you fit in, and, and you're going to have times in between jobs and all that. Look, that was my testimony to my, in my early 20s until I, I locked in on some full-time work. So I understand that, though. But when you get to be 30, like Jesus' age, like you need to be known as something. Like we have Sam the carpenter, Rob the IT guy, Matt the IT guy, Callum the estimator, and... and um, Caleb, the, um, the glass man or the, the, the locksmith. Caleb, the locksmith, you know. People need to be known for working hard. You don't want to be known for, he's that loser that's always hanging around getting in trouble. Like Jesus was known for, as Jesus, the carpenter. He worked hard. And that's what he was known for in his hometown. All right, so let's be known as working hard. Not being that person that's the internet troll in his mum's basement and he's, 40, and he's 40 years old playing video games. Like, don't be known as that. Be known as whatever, the worker, okay? Now, while we're talking about this, I do want to uh, debunk the false teaching which is out there, which I've come across this quite a few times over the decades, and that, that Jesus was a famous rabbi. Have you heard that before? Have you heard that teaching that Jesus was a famous rabbi? And, well, one person heard that. Anyway, you're going to hear about it anyway. And the teaching is that, you know, when Jesus, when he finds the, um, the disciples and he says, like, follow me, and they drop their nets and they follow him, like, the false teaching is that what's because they knew him as a famous rabbi. So when he comes past and he says, follow me, and they go, oh, yes, I get to follow this famous rabbi, and they just leave everything and they follow Jesus. And look, it's out there. Like, a lot of Pentecostals, they, they believe that. But it's not true. For the first reason is, in his hometown, did they say, oh, this is Jesus, the... The, the rabbi. That's why he knows all this stuff. No, this is Jesus the carpenter. He wasn't known as a rabbi in his hometown. But then someone might say, well, that's because he was a rabbi in Jerusalem. And he's known as being a rabbi in Jerusalem, not in his hometown. But well, let's have a look at Jesus in Jerusalem. And look, I'll just read it to you. So if you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's look at, at Jesus, what they said about him in Jerusalem. So John chapter 7, verse 14. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, 
How know of this man let us, having never learned? So in Jerusalem, they were saying, well, how does this man know all this stuff that he's preaching? Because he's never been taught. He's never learned. Meaning, like, if he was a rabbi, they would say, oh, he knows all this because he's a famous rabbi. So Jesus was just an ordinary guy, a carpenter that loved the father and was being faithful to his parents and just living a good, honest life every single day. And that's the sort of people God's looking for. He's not looking for the elite. He's not looking for celebrities. He's, well, that's the exception to the rule is that sometimes they do get called, those, those sort of um, like famous people and, and things like that and, and um, well-off people in the world, famous people. But normally it's just the average person, like a carpenter, or a publican that Jesus will call. And have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. So Jesus was no rabbi. He was no famous rabbi. He was just a normal guy, a carpenter. It says there, For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. I guess Paul would be the example, the exception to the rule for that. But other than that, Paul, like most people, you know, who are noble, um, who are wise after the flesh, look, they're not called. But God have chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God have chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world and things which are despised have God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So Jesus chooses everyday people that just have an honest job, that are working hard and love God. He chooses them to do a great work for them. Like, that's why when you see like, Kanye West apparently becoming a Christian, like, God doesn't care for that. Like, God doesn't care for that. And these sort of celebrities, they're like, well, I'm going to do God a favour now. I'm going to you know, preach the gospel, so-called gospel. I'm going to give God a shout-out from my, from my platform in the world. And like, they have this attitude of, look, I'm doing God a favour. God's lucky to have me is what these celebrities are like. And God doesn't care for that. God doesn't need that sort of attitude. Like, he just needs humble carpenters, Humble council workers, humble IT guys, just normal people, homeschool mums, you know, just normal people God's looking for to do a great work for them, to raise up great children. Amen. And let's have a look at Jesus when he chose people. Like he's not going to Herod, he's not going to the king, he's not going to the king's house trying to find educated people, he's not going to rabbis, he's not going to Pharisees, like he's going to everyday people. So turn to, to Matthew chapter 4 and have a look. So don't think because you're not in the right family, you're not educated enough, you haven't gone to Bible college, that God can't use you. Like if you haven't got all those things for you, then you're in a, a good place for God to use you and do a great work. And Jesus looked for men that were just average men, everyday men working hard. Matthew 4 verse 18 says, And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he saith unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. So they, they're following Jesus. Jesus was called this these average men. So if you want to be called by God to do a great work, just make sure like, you're doing something. Just don't be lazy. No, he didn't call lazy people. He didn't call unemployed people. He didn't call people who are just you know, living for themselves, not doing anything of substantial. Like, be working. You know, do something for God, and, and God can use you. Like, if you're moving in the right direction, or you're working already, then he can use you and get you working in his kingdom. And it says there that they followed him, not because he was a famous rabbi, and this is something Pastor Kevin shared when he was going through Luke. And the reason they followed him is because, look, they were baptised by John, and they heard John point to Jesus and say, look, he's the one you need to believe on. He's the Lamb of God. You need to believe on that man. And then Jesus comes along to Peter and Andrew and says, follow me. And they're like, oh, what a, what a privilege, what an honour. And they follow Jesus. Okay, So that's why they followed him, not because he's some famous rabbi or Jesus did some Jedi mind trick on them and made them follow him. Like It was because they knew who he was. They believed on him and they followed him. It was an honour. And verse 21, And going on from hence, he saw other two brethren, James the son of Zeb Zebedee, and John his brother, in the ship with Zebedee their father, mending their nets, and he called them, and they immediately left their net and their father and followed him. So we can see Jesus is looking for hard workers. Because if people are going to be working hard, 
um, in the world at a, at a job, but they're going to be working hard for the kingdom of God. They're going to be working hard following Jesus, and he knows that. So he finds these people which are already working hard. And Luke, I'll just read it to you, Luke chapter 5, verse 27. Look, there's even hope here for government workers. There's even hope for council workers, okay? <laughs> and after these things, he went forth and saw a publican. Like a publican is like a government service taking a, 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 a government servant like, and taking taxes from the people, okay? A bit like a parking officer, like taking taxes from people. I'm not a parking officer anymore, okay? He saved me from that. He saw me. He said, follow me. And I left being a parking officer and followed him. And named Levi, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And he left all, rose up and followed him. So here's Levi and he's got an office job. He's got a desk job. Like he's not building trenches. He's not catching fish. He's not building houses. He's not a carpenter. He's sitting behind a desk in an office in a council building, you know, and Jesus shows him. You know, even if you're doing a, doing a desk job, just do it well and that's good enough for God. Like, he'll use you and do a great work for you. But with Jesus, like, the sermon is called The Goodly Example of Jesus. Even though he was a hard worker, he was a carpenter, but he also was balanced. He also had a balance between working hard and also his own spiritual prayer time with the Father. And that's the third point that we can learn from Jesus this example is that Jesus would spend big chunks of time in prayer, okay? Big chunks of time in prayer, and that's an example for us. If we can turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 and verse 15, the third point is that Jesus made time for his prayer life and his devotional time. But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed of him of their infirmities. So there we can see that Jesus has gone, hard, got, gone from working hard as a carpenter to working hard in the ministry. He's still working hard. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. So he took time out from his, his work schedule to go into the wilderness and pray. And look, brethren, if Jesus needed to spend time in prayer, like big chunks of time in prayer, like so do we. Like we can't neglect our prayer life. We need to make time to go into our wilderness. Maybe it's your lounge room in the morning before everyone else gets up, or maybe it's going for a walk or going into uh, the forest or something like that. But find your own time to be with the Lord and pray. That's an example that we can get from Jesus. He prioritised that time with the Father. And Luke 6 verse uh, 12. If you can turn to Luke chapter 10, turn to Luke chapter 10, I'll read to you from Luke chapter 6 and verse 12. And it says, And it came to pass in those days that he went out into a mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. So Jesus spent all night in prayer. Oh, when did I last spend all night in prayer? I know. Sam spends all night in prayer all the time when he's writing his sermons. On a Saturday night, you find him in the prayer closet writing sermons. So Sam's doing this. But when, when, did, he, uh, when did we like, last spend all night in prayer seeking after God? Like Jesus needed to do that and so do we. And what was he doing? Like he was listening to the Father. He was watching what the Father was doing so then he could go and, and do the same things. And after he spent all this night in prayer, that's when he went out and he picked his 12 apostles. So he spent all night in prayer, making sure he knew which ones to choose, listening to the Father, praying, and then he goes out and he, and he does the will of, will of God. So you can get God's will for your life when you spend that time in prayer, reading your word, listening to the Father, and then you can go and do it. You know, we need to make sure that we spend as much time as you can in prayer. Make, make the time. If you've got to start work at 6, well, get up at... Well, you work it out with God. Get up before that and make sure you've got a lot of time to spend in the presence of God, reading the Word of God and praying. It's something that we can learn from Jesus. So he gave us that example and he also taught us that we should prioritise time with God. So you're there in Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. This is a popular verse. You're going to know this one, uh, this story. And it says, Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, do I not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. So Martha here, like she's working hard when she shouldn't be working. Martha's working when she should be in her prayer closet, when she should be sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing his word. And then she sees Mary 
praying or being with Jesus. And she's like bent out of shape. So, well, she should be working with me. And then Jesus, what did Jesus say? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Well, maybe if she spent more time reading her Bible and listening to Jesus and praying, she would not be as troubled as, as, as much. But one thing is needful, and Mary have chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. So we need to make sure that we don't take away the good part from our lives. And Jesus, that good part is that you're sitting at Jesus' feet. And we can do that whenever you want as, as a believer. You can do that whenever you want. We can do it in the morning, during the day, at night. We need to make sure we don't take away that good part. Like work hard, uh, be whatever you do, be a carpenter, be an IT guy, be a council worker, but don't take away that good part. Make sure you give as much time as you can, big chunks of time, to spending time with the Father. And look, you're always going to do what you want to do in life. Like if you want to seek after God, it's not going to be a problem. You're going to make the room, make the time to do that in your life. And this is something that we can see uh, Mary doing. So, so far we looked at that Jesus is a goodly example for us as far as children. As children, we need to seek after God uh, from an early age and we need to work hard, but also need to balance out that, that work with spending big chunks of time in prayer and reading the word and in fellowship with God. And the fourth point is about Jesus, is that Jesus did not need validation from men. He did not need honour from men. And that's something that we can learn from Jesus. We don't need to be dependent upon other people to, to praise us and lift us up and, and encourage us all the time. Like Jesus was dependent upon the Father to be encouraged by the Father. Like it's always good when people say, you know, good job, you, you did a great job doing this, or that was a good sermon, or... You know, I like what you did there. That's good. Like, as humans, it's good to be encouraged. But we shouldn't be fishing for those compliments. We shouldn't be dependent upon those compliments. If we don't get them, we're all just depressed and sad. We don't want to be like that because that we can learn from Jesus that he wasn't like that. So let's have a look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5 and verse 33. And while you're turning there, uh, John 5, 41 says, I received not honour from men. So Jesus was not looking to receive honour from men. And we should not be looking to receive honour from men as well. We shouldn't be looking to, to have people prop us up all the time. We should be secure enough in our walk with God not to need that like Jesus was. So John 5, 33 says, You sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I received not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be, be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father has sent, have, have given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father have sent me. And the Father himself which have sent me have borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seeing his shape. So the father, father was the one that bore witness of Jesus. Even though John the Baptist, he did bear witness of Jesus, he said, look, that's great that John did that. I don't need man to bear witness of me because I've got the father. The father's a greater witness than the witness of man, than the witness of John. So when you're doing something for God, whatever it is, raising your children, going to work, preaching a sermon, leading a Bible study at home, song leading, it's Jesus is the one that you want to do it before. You want him to be pleased with you. If men don't say anything about how good or bad it was, you shouldn't be bent out of shape. You should be doing it unto the Lord and let the Father be the one that witnesses and says, good job. Because when you do anything, you should do it unto the Lord. But when you preach a sermon, you should do it unto the Lord before it's unto anybody else. And you want him to be pleased. And if he's pleased, then that's all that matters. So this is something that Jesus modeled for us he 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 did this he showed us like how we should live and that we shouldn't receive looking we shouldn't be looking to receive that honor from men uh john 12 just turn to john 12 now chapter 42 john 12 chapter 42 it says nevertheless among the chief rulers also many believed on him but because of the pharisees they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. So we should look for God's praise. We should look for God to say to us, well done. You know, not looking for the praises of men. Yeah. 
So that was the, the fourth point, was we should not be looking to receive honour from men. We should not be looking to be dependent upon other people to say, good job. We should be secure enough to have the Father as being the one that we look to for approval. And it's going to give you a lot of liberty, a lot of freedom in life to just to be, the, be who you're called to be. And the fifth point I want to make from the goodly example of Jesus is that Jesus was a man of this total resolve and total purpose. And this is something quite incredible about his life. So if you can turn to Luke chapter 9, Luke chapter 9, verse 51, everything that the Father called him to do, he just did it with absolute resolve. And this is a great lesson we can take from Jesus. He wasn't of a divided mind when it came to doing the Father's will. He gave himself fully to it. And Luke, 51, uh, Luke 9, verse 51 says, And it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So he's going to go to Jerusalem to die on the cross. And he, he steadfastly set his face to go and do it. Even though he knew he just suffered terribly, like he steadfastly set himself to go and do it. Like he was going to do it no matter what, and nothing was going to stop him from doing it. And that's the same resolve we need to have when we're doing God's will. Just be totally resolved. Don't be double-minded. Don't just put it off. Just, just do it. If God's called you to do something, just do it. And this aspect of Jesus' personality or his character was actually prophesied about that Jesus would have such resolve and such steadfastness in his, in his life. And it was prophesied of by Isaiah. So if you turn there to Isaiah chapter 50, I just want to show you this. It's pretty fascinating. Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 5. So this is something that stood out so much about Jesus' character and his life that it was prophesied about. So it's no small aspect of his life. And Isaiah 50 verse 5, it says, The Lord God hath opened mine ear. I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. So this is a prophecy about Jesus going to the cross to suffer. And he did not turn back. He just gave himself steadfastly to the mission. And it's quite amazing. Like, If he can just do this steadfastly and not draw back, then how much more can we do the things that God's called us to do? Like, we're not called to go and die on the cross and suffer like Jesus suffered. And he did that steadfastly. He was not rebellious. And like we can be rebellious all the time. Like when we, for example, like when we know we need to go to work and we don't go to work. Or we know we need to pray and seek God and we don't do that. Like let's not be rebellious. Let's steadfastly set ourselves to do those things, to go and pray, to go, go to work, raise our children, spend time with our children, in instructing them in the ways of God. Let's steadfastly do those things which we need to do. And let's keep reading in verse 7, Isaiah 50 verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. So Jesus set his face like a flint to, to do the Father's will, to go to the cross. He was like set so steadfast that nothing was going to stop him from doing it. And a flint is like a, like a hard rock, like a super hard rock. And Deuteronomy chapter 8 talks about the rock of flint, like a super hard rock. So he set himself like a, like a hard rock. Nothing was going to budge him. Nothing was going to move him. He's going to do what the Father's called him to do, and that's what we need to be like. And let me read to you from Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 8. It says, Behold, I have made thy face strong against their faces, and thy forehead strong against their foreheads, as an adamant, an adamant is like something like a diamond, like a hard rock. As an adamant harder than flint have I set thy forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. So Ezekiel, he's talking about Ezekiel, that he said he's, God was going to set his face as harder than flint to go and, and give the message that he was called to do. Of course, it has a secondary or application for Jesus was the same. And when we go preaching the gospel, soul winning, let's be harder than flint. Let's go there and be totally resolved. We're going to go give the gospel and just be faithful and not, not back down from being faithful. And, and that's what we can learn from Jesus. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, knowing that he's going to suffer. And this is like an incredible example, you know. What, what man, like he's, he's such a, a strong man. He's, he's, like you see those pictures of Jesus and he looks like a, like a weakling, but like he was just a strong, determined man to do the Father's will. 
And the, and the, sec- oh, the sixth, rather, the sixth um, good example of Jesus I want to look at is that Jesus was rejoicing. He was a person that rejoiced in terrible circumstances. So even on the way to the cross, like he's rejoicing. Like Jesus was an emotional guy. He wasn't afraid to let his emotions get out there. Like he was rejoicing, he was, he was weeping, he was getting angry. We see all these emotions in Jesus and we shouldn't be afraid to be emotional. Like we're not ta- I'm not talking about getting in the flesh and being silly and putting on the show. I mean, being spiritual men and women, walking in the Spirit, and then having our emotions under the control of the Holy Spirit like Jesus did. And we can be emotional. You can get excited about church. You can, get, uh, you can weep with people that weep, rejoice with people that are rejoicing. And we need to learn from Jesus that you know, you can be emotional. And what you can also learn is that our joy is rooted in, in our relationship with God, not in our circumstances. Look, if you think about Jesus going to the cross to be crucified, look, you'd be depressed. Like you'd be down in the dumps if you're like a normal person, but Jesus is rejoicing because his relationship um, with his father is what determines his, his, how he feels about things and not his circumstances. So have a look there in Luke chapter 10, verse 21. And we need to learn to look to Jesus for our, for our, our, like our plumb line in life. We don't want to be looking to our circumstances to get joy from our circumstances but we want to be looking to Jesus to get our joy, our peace, everything we need in life from Jesus and the Word of God, not from our circumstances. So Luke 10 verse 21 says, In that hour Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. So Jesus on his way to Jerusalem and he's rejoicing. He's praying to the Father and it's causing him to rejoice. Like when you pray, when you get into the Word of God, that should make you happy. It should make you rejoice. Regardless of what's going on around about you in the world, it doesn't matter. If you're seeking after God, then he should be your source of everything that you need in life, your joy, your peace, everything that you need. And this is what Jesus has modelled for us. And we need to make sure that we look to the Lord and not to our circumstances. Like that's what the world does. The world works hard at trying to get all their circumstances just right. And then they can feel happy. If I have more money, then I can sort of get my circumstances just right. And then I can be happy. I can be peaceful. I can enjoy life. And then something else goes wrong or someone breaks in and steals. And, and then they're still unhappy. But it, it doesn't work. Like the only way you can be happy in life is by being right with God, walking with God. Hebrews chapter 12 Verse 2, famous verse, this one. And it gives us an insight into Jesus' life, how he's so joyful. It's looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So Jesus looked beyond the cross to the joy that he's going to have. And that's what kept him going. That's what kept him joyful while he's on his way to Jerusalem to die. And even in the natural, excuse me, even in the natural, like you look forward to things in the future to give you joy. Like if you're working a job you might not like too much, you're going to be looking forward to Friday. You think, oh, Friday's going to come in a few days' time. I'm going to have the weekend off. And that can give you joy to keep on going uh, for, your, for your work week. So worldly people, they do look for things to, to give them joy in the future that they can look towards. But how much more for us that we can learn from Jesus when you're looking forward to all the good things that we have in store? Like it's um, incredible. You've got the rapture that's going to happen. You're going to have a new body. You're going to live and, and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And then you're going to go into eternity forever and ever and ever. Look, that should give you joy. That should give you joy. Like someone chews you out or the boss gets stuck into you or you get persecuted... Well, big deal. I know what I'm looking forward to. And Jesus, he looked beyond the cross to the joy that was going to be set before him on the other side, where he's going to sit down with the Father, having been faithful, completed his mission, and redeemed mankind back to the Father. That's what he's looking forward to, the joy set before him. He was able to endure the cross. And we need to, as believers, look forward to the joy set before us. And that's going to give you joy. Don't look for the joy in the world. Look for the joy set before us in the kingdom of God and those great things that Jesus has for us. And that's going to keep you joyful, keep you happy, and, and overcoming in all, sort of, all sorts of crazy circumstances in life. Turn to John chapter 15. Okay, 
start with John, John 15 and verse 11. John 15 verse 11 is a great verse about joy. John 15 11, Jesus says, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. So Jesus was a joyful guy, because he's saying, the joy I have, I want to give it to you. So if Jesus wasn't a joyful guy, he'd be saying, like, no, thank you, Jesus. I've seen your joy, you know, I don't want it. But because he was so joyful, he could say that to people, my joy is going to remain in you. And they'd be like, well, amen, because you're so happy all the time. You're so joyful all the time. And that's the joy that we can have. We can have Jesus' joy. Or you can have the world's joy. It's up to you. You Choose to have Jesus' joy, which is not dependent upon circumstances. It's not dependent upon having everything just perfect in your life. It's dependent upon being right with God, walking with the Lord. You can have his joy. Because you can see how powerful his joy is at the... At the footsteps of the cross, he's joyful. On the way to the cross, he's got joy. And you can have that same joy. Imagine that. Like the joy of the Lord is our strength, Nehemiah tells us. We need to have that joy. It's going to give you strength in life. Now, the last point is this. So this is, a, this is a, um, like a pretty special point here that we can learn from Jesus. Is that Jesus, we can learn from Jesus where we need to ask for help. Like Jesus, he showed us that sometimes you need to ask for help. Like even Jesus needed to ask his disciples for some help. And that's pretty amazing that Jesus, Son and God, will become dependent upon man like for help. And that's an example for us. We need to be dependent upon one another at times when, when we need it. So turn to Matthew chapter 26. We're going to read about probably one of the greatest honours any person can ever have in, in, in life, in the history of the world. This is probably the greatest honour you could have. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. But another example of, of a great privilege that a, that a man had. Like I think this is probably the greatest honour you could ever have in, in life or anyone that's ever had in the history of the world. You know when Jesus was on his way to, um, to be crucified, and he's carrying his cross, Amen. okay? And he, he couldn't carry it. And, and they, they made this guy, Simon of Cyrene, to come and carry it for him. Look, that's incredible. Like, I think that would be the greatest honour you could ever have in, in life. Look, that's what I would... If I could choose to be any character in the Bible, look, I would choose that guy that got to carry his cross. Like, I think that's quite incredible, you know? And, but anyway, I think that would be amazing but as well as that this is also amazing as well matthew 26 verse 36 then cometh jesus with them unto a place called gethsemane and saith unto the the disciples sit ye here while i go and pray yonder and he took with him peter and the two sons of zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy so jesus had real emotions Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. And listen to this, Tarry ye here and watch with me. So he's saying to Peter, James and and Peter, Andrew and John, saying, Stay here with me. I I need you to be with me. Just just watch with me. I'm just so (laughs) sorrowful right now. Just, Just watch here and be with me. And I think that's just incredible that Jesus would turn to someone and say, Look, I just need you to be with me at the moment. And that's an example for us. Like, we need one another. When you're going through a hard time, it's going to be helpful to get around faithful people in church, people full of faith, who, who know God, who understand what it's like to, to, to live life. And we need to be around one another. That's why it's so good to be in church. But sadly, like, this was a missed opportunity for Peter. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So see, there again we see he set his face like a flint. He said, Lord, if this can't pass from me, that's fine. Look, I'm going to do it. I'm going to still do it. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto them, uh, unto Peter, Peter, what could you not watch with me one hour? Look, that's pretty sad. That's pretty sad. Well, what a missed opportunity when Peter could have been there for Jesus. The one time Jesus needed someone to be with him, he wasn't there. Like he spent his whole life for other people, ministering, healing, preaching, 
casting out devils, raising the dead, and one hour he didn't have anyone there to be with him. Well, that's pretty sad. Like Peter, he missed it there. Okay? But remember, Jesus said, when you do it unto the least of these, you do it unto me. So you can still do what Peter missed out by ministering to one another, Amen. being there for one another. So you, you don't have to miss out like Peter did. Like, man, I, Peter must have been... He made up for it, didn't he? He made up for it the rest of his life, you know, just serving Jesus, being faithful, preaching the gospel, doing great works. But man, what a missed opportunity by Peter. Let's keep reading. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak. So again there, we saying, watch and pray. You know, develop your prayer life, guys. You need to be praying and watching because the flesh is, is weak. The flesh is weak. And, you know, a wretched man that I am, like, we need to be praying because the flesh will pull us down. Yeah. And he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Like, what a, what a great man. Like, what a great man Jesus was. And he's doing this for us. You know, we're, we're on his mind. He's looking into the future. He's seen everyone that needs him to do this. He's depending upon him. And he's saying, look, Lord, if there's another way, look, you can count on me. I'm going to do it. I've set my face steadfastly to do this. What a great example. What a great example Jesus is. The goodly example of Jesus. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. But there's no answer. My father didn't answer him. Like in another account of this story, like we see angels come, but we don't hear the father saying anything to him. The father is just silent. And, but he, what did he do? He just kept on doing what he knew was right. So when you pray about things and, and God doesn't answer, nothing happens, just keep doing what you know is right. Keep, keep being steadfast, doing those things which you know you should be doing. And this is what Jesus did. Then come he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And then he goes on and he completes his mission, being faithful to the Father, steadfast. And Jesus, like he is just the best example. He's a like, goodly example. And let me just remind you of those seven points. The first one was that as a young child, Jesus was seeking after the things of God and we should be the same as young children as well. We should be seeking after, our children should be seeking after God. Work hard, but also make sure you balance that out with spending time with God and also don't be dependent upon the praise of men. Don't do works to be seen of men, just do them to please the Father and be resolved to do God's will. Be steadfast to do God's will. Be joyful, have joy and also when you need to, Go to others for help, like Jesus did. Like he's an example. You know, if he needed to go to Peter for help, we need to go to one another for help as well. Amen.